Hello and welcome to From Data to Decisions. This is Lecture 25. Where I'm going to show you in Excel and in R how to do some uh, testing for heteroscedasticity. We're going to look at two tests, the Bartlett test and the Brown Forsyth test. And my first example is a fake example, which are sometimes the most informative. What I've done is made up two data sets. And both of these data sets are um, pulling random numbers from a normal distribution. So I put them into two groups. Remember that these tests take our data, divide it up into groups, and then compare the variance of each group to see if they're different. So my first group here, uh, I, I've collected these random numbers. So I use the rand function at 0 and 1. So that's a probability between 0 and 1. I put that into the norm.inverse function. And it outputs a random variable following a normal distribution. And then I supply it a mean of 0 and a, st a standard deviation of, well, whatever I put, this cell. So here I have the standard deviation is 1. And I get a set of data. I then calculate the mean and the variance of that data. Now, the variance should be 1, but of course, every single time I generate 50 random numbers, it'll be slightly different than 1. That's the randomness that we have to take into account when making our comparisons. Likewise, over here, I, I did the exact same thing, except for I can change the input standard deviation to be whatever I want. Then I have both the Bartlett test and the Brown's Forsyth test at work. I've put the equations for both of these uh, tests in the spreadsheet itself. And for the Bartlett test, I use the simplified version of the equation for the special case when the group size uh, is the same. N is the same for both group 1 and group 2. There's a more complicated equation you can plug in if you have different sized groups. Here we have the same size group. Now let's just simply say uh, both of the variances are equal to 1 for both groups. Um, of course, they're not exactly one when I actually calculate them. Nonetheless, the Bartlett t comes out to be 0.5, uh, which is far less than our critical value, either for alpha of 0.05 or alpha of 0.01. So we can't reject the null hypothesis. And if I made that 1.2, for example, well, with only 50 data points, look, well, look what just happened. The data point with a standard deviation of 1.2 is coming back with a calculated variance less than 1, whereas the one with the standard deviation of 1 is coming back with a calculated variance of 1.3. Right? Uh, the exact opposite of what you think it would be. Right? Still, nonetheless, the Bartlett t is too small to reject. I'll go up to 1.5. Ah, now I got a case where that uh, Bartlett t is 8, which is above. All right, but if I get a diff some different ones, now this Bartlett t is 5, um, even though the inputs still have uh, 1 and 1.5 as the two standard deviations for those two groups. Uh, a Bartlett t of 5 would allow you to reject the null hypothesis if alpha was 0.05, but not if alpha is 0.01. Right? This, is, this is what you see about sampling distributions. Uh, of course, if I make the difference large enough, so here's the standard deviations, 5 versus 1. That's very clear. The Bartlett t becomes huge, and there's no doubt about it. All right, let's go back to this uh, 1.5 versus 1 and try the Born, uh, brown Forsyth test. Right, now, the brown Forsyth test relies on median. So I calculate the median of the group. Then I make a column which is the absolute deviate from the median. So I take the difference between the y data point and the median, take the absolute value. And then I find the mean of all of those uh, deviations, as well as the variance of all those absolute deviations. And that's what gets used in uh, the calculation of the brown Forsyth t. We calculate a pooled variance and a t factor. And this statistic is a t distributed. The Bartlett factor is, in fact, chi square distributed with a, uh, a degree of freedom of 1. Okay, And so we can test, compare the Bartlett Forsyth 
statistic to its critical values and at uh, 3.2 it fails both of those tests just like the Bartlett does for this particular example. A different example uh, we see that the found Forsyth, Forsyth test does not fail either criterion alpha 0.05 or 0.01 whereas the Bartlett T is in between it fails at 05 and doesn't fail at 01. Well this demonstrates that you'll get st different statistical results depending upon on which test you use the Bartlett T test will be have more power if the assumption of a normal distribution is correct the Brown Forsyth test will do better for non-normal distributions because it's uh, not dependent upon the nature of the distribution for the test. Uh, here's some real data. This is the flow meter data we've seen before. We fit it to a straight line. Um, we have a couple of data points that might be outliers, and that could throw off the distribution of residuals. Maybe the distribution of residuals is not so normal. Nonetheless, we can calculate both the Bartlett T and the Brown Forsyth statistics. In this case, the Bartlett T is, is 9.7, and that's bigger than both of our critical values. And so we would say reject the null hypothesis. Variances of these two groups are the same, uh, which brings a good point, um, I, I should mention. I've got 39 data points. How do you split that up evenly between two groups? Uh, if you're using uh, the, the statistical software package, it doesn't matter. They don't care exactly even if you're using these simplified formulas that I've been using then it does matter and so what I do is stick the middle point in both groups I should also mention how do you divide up your data into two groups uh, the most common way would be to divide it up by predicted y values since this is a, a, a simple uh, single regressor, I could also just sort by the X values. In this case, the X is the temperature. So I sorted the data by temperature from lowest to highest, and then I, I, I picked the bottom half, which are all these data points here, compared to the top half, which are all these data points up here. And uh, see that the Bartlett t-test does fail, can reject the null hypothesis, but when I do the uh, brown Forsyth test, I get 1.2, that statistic which is below the critical T values. So our, our P value for the statistic is 0.24. So I cannot reject the null hypothesis that these two groups have the same variance using the Brown Forsyth test. Right. Well, what I think is going on here is the Bartlett T is simply detecting the fact that we've got uh, a non-normal distribution. It just so happens my two flyers are in one group flyers, maybe they're flyers, they're certainly on the more extreme side, long out on the tail, uh, but they're all in one group and the other group doesn't have any of those flyers. Well, I'm not sure that that's an indication that the variance is changing, it's simply an indication that I've got a couple of extreme values that happen to be only in one group. So that's all you're really detecting there. All right, that's Excel. It's a little bit cumbersome to do any of these tests in Excel. It's much easier to do it in R. So let's look at R. Uh, I have a, a script, heteroscedasticity.r, that is up on the website for the class, so you can download it. I'm going to do the exact same test. I'll read in the flow rate calibration data set. But because we're going to need to order our data by temperature so that I can split it up into two groups, uh, I'm going to show you a little function called um, order that will allow me to do that. So I've got the data, which I'll call flow unsorted. And then I'll take that data, flow unsorted, and with the square brackets here and here, that's the full array of all the data. Then I'll use this function called order, and I'll order by temperature. So it takes all the same data, but just reorders it. And then I'll call that one flow. All right, so let me run some of these. So my original data 
Numbers started at 85.5, 85.5, 85.6, 85.1, etc. And after I sorted it, in order, 80, 80.1, 80.2, 80.6, 80.7. So uh, we're going to now work with this ordered set of data. That will make it a lot easier for us to split it up into the two groups. All right, we can. We always start by plotting the data, and then we can model it. And uh, there's a summary down in the console of that model. We've seen this before. I want to do testing on the externally studentized residuals. So I'll use the studres function that pulls those externally studentized residuals out of the model. And I'll call that variable, that array of numbers, SR. All right, how are we going to split it up into two, two groups? Well, what I'm going to do is create a variable that has labels. So I'm going to label the groups one and two. I could label them A and B. I could label them you know, low temperature, high temperature. It doesn't matter what labels I choose. But I need a, a column of data that's, that labels which group you're in. I'm going to call them group one and group two. So I'll, I'll label them ones and twos. So first thing I do is calculate the number or the length of this vector ESR. So I look over here, n, there's 39. So that just means there's 39 data points in my data set. Then I'm going to create a new variable called group. And I'm going to fill this with 39 values of 2. So this rep function is just repeat. And it says repeat the number 2 n times. And take that array and put it into a new variable called group. So that's all I did. There's group up here. And it says there's 39 values in this array. And it's 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Great. Now I'm going to take the first 19 of those 39 values and change it to 1. So here I'm going to take group and say between 1 and n over 2, assign all those values to 1. And sure enough, if I look up here, it's assigned them to 1. And if I were to uh, actually just type the word group and hit Control-R, it'll dump group down into the console. And I can see it's a bunch of 1s until I hit the 20th data point, and then it's a bunch of 2s. All right. Now I've got this label group, and I can run my test. I'll, I'll begin by the Bartlett test, which is built into R, and uh, I supply it with the 39 ESR values. And then as the factor I'll use to split them up, use the variable group. Right? That's what this command does. And remember, the group just has ones and twos to help decide which of those data points I'm going to call group one versus group two. So if I run that test, it simply comes down here, gives me the Bartlett's factor and the p-value. In this case, the p-value is less than 0.01, just like we saw in the Excel spreadsheet. We can also run the uh, Brown Forsyth test. To do that, we need to install a new package called Lawstat. I've already installed it, but you'll have to install it. And I need to set that library. Uh, it is loading up those packages. Now I can run Levine.test. Now the problem Forsyth test is a version of a Levine test. It's a slight modification of the Levine test. So this routine Levine.test has the ability to um, do the Brown Forsyth. In fact, that's the default if I don't add any extra parameters. But it can also do some modifications of that test, which we haven't talked about. I call it the exact same way using the same group to label the data. And when I run that test, it gives me a p-value of 0.24, just like we saw um, before. Excel is not statistically significant um, when I do the Brown Forsyth test. All right, so that's how we perform these tests in R. That's our lecture. Until next time.